From deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fish and Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas Outdoor Nation. I'm your humble host, the hostess with the mostest, Dustin Vaughn Warnke. Serve many roles in the outdoor industry, and I love to have the chance to connect with you. It is awesome that you are listening. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for checking out this show. Whether you are listening online, or whether you are downloading this show on your mobile device, whether you are streaming it, however you're listening, and wherever you're listening, I really do appreciate you. We are a Texas-based magazine, but this podcast goes all over the world, and i um, trying to bring you guys some good content that is going to help you in the outdoors do things a little bit differently and uh, do things better and be more effective and efficient in what you do in the outdoors. That's always one of my goals for the show is just to educate you and uh, and help you, inspire you to do great things and have the best of the outdoors for yourself. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in and checking out our show. Today I've got Cal Gonzalez, my buddy Cal from um, uh, from uh, Texas Fishing Game Magazine and one of our own uh, saltwater editor and uh, just an incredible guy. I just love this guy. I love the heart that he has for um, for fishing and for conservation and for making the um, making the right choices when it comes to what he's going to talk about on this show today, which is outside of the box fishing strategies. And these are just some ideas that will help you catch fish even when the fish don't want to be caught. And uh, these are just some different ideas that you probably won't hear on a lot of other podcasts or reading a lot of other magazines or, um, you know, check out on a lot of different blogs and, and wherever you get your media and your information from. My whole goal of this show and what I do in this podcast is to just help you understand the outdoor lifestyle, the fact that we love to hunt and fish, the fact that this is part of our, our blood, our DNA, um, our, our, our being is, is to fish and hunt. And uh, I know a lot of you guys do that for recreation. I do it for you know a career as well, which I've very, been very blessed to have a career that I can do uh, work in the outdoor industry full time. Um, but I just have to have this message out there. Hope, inspiration, and the outdoor lifestyle. That is what I'm all about teaching on this podcast. And I certainly am no expert in a lot of things, but I love to have guests like Cal on that help you know, teach, uh, teach us, you know, some different thoughts of, of what to do when the fish aren't biting and what to, what to do that might work for you. If, uh, if you're having a rough day out in the water, or if you just want to try some new things. And we talk about a lot of nostalgic memories as well about fishing, um, on this show. I think it's a great interview. So here's my interview with Mr. Cal Gonzalez, uh, Texas fishing game, saltwater editor. Here we go. Joining me on the phone, Mr. Cal Gonzalez, Texas Fishing Games Saltwater Editor. How you doing tonight, Cal? I am Big D. If I were any better, I'd have to be twi- twins just to handle it. <laughs> They'd have to clone you? Is that what you're saying, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. They would have to clone me, and honestly, I don't think if this world could handle two of me. Two Cals? No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Cal, you live South Texas. Um, what what city do you live near? I, I forget. I live in Edinburgh, Texas, which is right next to McAllen, Texas, which is... um. Not the end of the world, but you can hear it from there. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I, I like to tell people I live in a really great spot because I am an hour and 15 minutes from South Padre Island. Right. I am 48 minutes from Port Mansfield. I am an hour and 10 minutes from Falcon Lake. And I am an hour and 20 minutes from Choke Canyon. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a, you're kind of a century located in South Texas in a way as far as getting to a lot of oh, the yeah. hot fishing spots. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. It's it's a great spot to be. I'm far enough inland that if we ever get a tropical storm or a hurricane, we don't get the teeth of it. But right. We'll get the wind, we'll get the rain, but we won't get hammered. Sure. You know? No, that's good. So it's, it's pretty cool. So you're it's mainly cool you're mainly a saltwater guy for the most part, but you do some freshwater too, correct? Because you've got a boat that can do both, Oh, I'll right? do some. Yeah, I have a boat that can do both. I'll do, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fish for crappie and I'll fish for, for catfish. I'm... If a bass happens to to find what I'm doing attractive, I'll I'll, I'll reel one of those suckers in. Um, but um, with my wife, it's it's about the crappie. It's all about the crappie. 
you know, it's, a, so. it's a sporting and fish I'll, to catch for sure. I mean, it's definitely, it's a smaller fish, so it's not as intimidating as like a giant 10 pound bass, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, I, I look at it this way for bait fish when I fish with mealworms and night crawlers with my son, uh, it's all about, it's all about the grind. It's all about getting in there and, and, and outsmarting that quarry, you know? Oh yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, you know, and, and a lot of people think crappie is just, just dumb fish that, that you drop a minnow in its face and it's it's going to eat it. And <laughs> there are times where they're they're like that, but there right. are other times where you have, have to um you have to have a strategy. You know, right. I mean, sometimes they're real tight to the brush and you've got to figure out how to get up in there with them. Yep. Um, there are other times where they're in pretty deep water and they're in a snotty mood and you've got to figure out how you're going to get them, especially when they're suspended. Right. You know, and and um, success is not always guaranteed with crappie. You know. Um, you know, it's it's very much like, you know, in saltwater, a lot of people look at the mangrove snapper and they look at the sheep's head and they think those are two fish that, you know, you just drop a shrimp in front of them and, and it's it's a done deal. Right. But um, they will sometimes demand that you have some kind of strategy. Right. They can be very wily, you know. Yeah, no, you're and, right. Um, the, you know, the, I have seen times where I was on the jetties and you could literally see the sheep's head hovering over rocks. And you'll throw everything in front of them, and they won't even pay attention, and they'll leave you talking to yourself. It's like when I was a, you know, a young man, a young boy, when I was at Landa Park in New Braunfels, Texas, and anybody from that area can, can attest that we had these giant fish called tilapia, which you no doubt know oh, yeah. in the South Texas. But I didn't really even know that a tilapia existed back then. I, and they just looked huge underwater. And then... Uh, you know they all they're vegetarian fish for the most part so we try to drop anything we could to even snag the darn things and we couldn't do it so that's what that kind of reminded me of yeah yeah they, it, they can be that way and everyone thinks tilapia big dumb fish you know they're right. not that bright but again they'll make you look like an idiot you know most all fish can make make you feel that way even catfish oh yeah you know absolutely you you have to sometimes you have to have a strategy excuse me, <clears throat> sometimes you have to have a very specific strategy for the quarry you're going after. Right. Um, a great example, last week, um, Sandy and I had a, a trip with Captain Carlos Garcia, uh -huh. um, an excellent an excellent captain, by the way. For anyone who ever goes down to the island, if you're interested, Captain Carlos Garcia, he's got a website, just look him up, great guy. Um, we were fishing and we tossed every piece of hardware we had in the tackle box. I mean, we threw DOA, DOA cal shad. We threw um, jerk baits. We threw top waters. I threw my favorite lure currently, which is the DOA airhead. And we were catching trout that were not measuring out. I mean, they were little trout. Sandy caught a bad gum hardhead on an on airhead. <laughs> That's how tough it was. <laughs> That's tough fishing, man. So, you get your hard head on a lure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, you you know, you've hit rock bottom. <laughs> so exactly. finally, Godless says, you know, Godless says, you know, I've got a bucket of shrimp here. Let's try for some black drum. So we set up a couple of bottom rigs. We tossed them out, and um, I had a hit within three minutes of of the dead shrimp hitting the, bo the hitting the bottom, and I reeled in a nineteen inch trout. Nice. You know, so I just we we thought that was a fluke. And we kept tossing out, and um, over the next hour and a half, we caught nine speckled trout, you know, on, on the bottom with dead shrimp. Sandy kind of preoccupied us for 30 minutes in that hour, by the way, because she hooked and landed a 50-pound stingray. Right, <laughs> you know? naturally, so of course. Leave it to her to do that. Right. Yeah, but we caught, we caught um, a pretty decent box of trout on a very hard, windy day. And we were fishing with dead shrimp on the bottom, you know. Which is like hardheadville too, right? Am I right? Yeah, that's yeah, that's that is. <laughs> and and fun, uh, ironically, we didn't catch any hardheads. We caught a skipjack. <laughs> we caught some some finfish, but we were catching the trout at the bottom on the edge of the intercoastal waterway with shrimp. Isn't that funny? You know, wow, dead shrimp, in fact. Yeah, dead shrimp, it's, dude. It's hilarious. Because really. one of the, one of the guys I fish with on the coast of um, off of um, where is it? I'm trying to think. Sea Drift, uh, Port O'Connor area, uh, mid coast, kind of. He uh, he basically had a whole deal where he was like, well, every time we'd have a, a croaker or something die. 
he we catch a hard head and he said well this is why you got to keep your bait alive you know and if a seagull comes and grabs yeah. it or you know with this talent with his feet or you know it's it's uh it's uh talons or whatever you've got to replace it or else you're going to catch a hard head but i was just like okay i mean you guys are catching fish <laughs> without even you know yeah. on, on dead shrimp which is like hardhead you know 101 you know i mean exactly you wow. know and like i said we we weren't even focusing on trout we were focusing on black drum but sometimes your strategies have to change yes you know and on this particular day the trout wanted meat you know and they wanted it something very particular and they wanted it presented in a very particular way um that doesn't mean if we hadn't been sh- free shrimping, we wouldn't have caught them. But, you know, the fact that they were not striking the the plastics we were presenting to them or the topwaters we were presenting to them, they were sitting down deep and they wanted meat, you know. Um, right. And sometimes when you fish, especially in salt water, you've got to think out of the box if you want to, if you want to succeed. Right. The traditional techniques aren't always going to work. So it's not you know, that, you know, you don't always have to go with what is known. You sometimes have to venture into some crazy stuff to catch some fish. Is that your point? Yeah, not just crazy, but but blatantly unorthodox. <laughs> that, that's kind of crazy, isn't it, Cal? <laughs> it just can be. It tight. can be. Blatantly yeah, unorthodox. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, um, it, 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 you know, I mean... What I think of as orthodox would be, um, and I'm going way back in time for this. Okay. Think of the first sugar. Think of the first Sugar Ray Leonard Thomas Hearns fight. Thomas Hearns had had this reach that he could probably knock you out from the other side of the ring, and Sugar Ray Leonard was six inches shorter, had a shorter reach, um, and had but he had faster hands, and. The strategy in that fight completely changed. Thomas Hearns didn't go in to try and destroy Ray, Sugar Ray Leonard. He got up on his toes and he started using his boxing skills and he was sticking out this jab that kept Sugar Ray Leonard on the outside. Right. So around the ninth, around the ninth round, Leonard changed his strategy and just started walking in on Hearns and started pounding into him, just blasting him. Okay. And he knocked, he knocked Hearns out in the 14th round. You saw right there, both fighters used what would have been unorthodox strategies for them. Leonard, the boxer, turned, in, turned into a slugger. Hearns, the slugger, turned into a boxer. You know, it was out-of-the-box thinking, and for both of them, it was actually very it was very successful. Hearns was winning the fight before he got knocked out, and, of course, Leonard knocked him out. Um, as an angler, you've got, you've got to think outside the box sometimes. One of my favorite examples is um, the curly-tailed grub. Okay. You know, the curly-tailed grub is one of the most popular lures in freshwater. Everyone uses it. Bass fishermen, um, panfish fishermen, striper, anything will hit a curly tail. Not many anglers, or at least on the Texas coast, use the curly tail. Huh. You know, I mean, have you ever used one in salt water? No, never. That's a good point. Really, Cal. Exactly. Yeah. No, I never yeah. have. How I learned this off of Captain Larry Corbett, who was my mentor when I first started using lures in salt water. Um, he, he we we he had a bag full of um, H and H curly tails in, of course, red and white, and we started throwing them on a t- uh, on a day when the weather was hot. The water was in the 80s oh, and wow. the fish were were just were just in a very negative mood. Yeah. So what we did was we found some deeper water by the color change and we started tossing them out and just slow rolling them, not twitching them, just slow rolling them near the bottom and we started catching trout. After that day, I always had a supply of curly tails in at least four different colors in my tackle box because you never know when they're going to work and here's the thing on a football head jig, they are absolute stone cold death on flounder. Really? Yes, I can see I, that. I, I am not kidding. But you, no. you think of a football jig being used more for a, a bat, you know, a jig like a, like a like a um, you know like a bass it's jig. It's a bass jig. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. I never thought of a football the football jig in uh you know, or jig head in uh in in saltwater before. 
Well, the reason I use the football head in salt water is that I learned that you can keep contact with the bottom a lot more effectively with a football head than with anything else. You know, That's a good and point. I know that yeah, you know, and I know that there are bottom bouncing jig heads for saltwater that are out there. But the football head doesn't bounce. It drags along the bottom. You know, and that is the exact strike zone where you want to keep the lure. Because, yes, flounder will come up and attack jigs in the mid-depths and they even on the surface, because I've had a flounder hit a, a topwater before. But they're bottom hunting predators. And they attack crustaceans mostly and mud minnows that tend to, to gravitate to the bottom. Right. You know, so you want to keep down there most often. Blasted. I've even had, red, and of course, redfish will hit it. Black drum will hit it. Trout will pick up stuff off the bottom too. I, we were talking about how I bottom fished for them recently. Sure. Um, so a curly tail on a football jig is an out of the box strategy that can be very time. Right. You know, and um, it, again, it's out of the box thinking. It's two examples: the curly tail itself. You know, logically, you would think, you know, that would be a very effective lure underneath a popping cork or a Mansfield mall. Sure, sure, absolutely, know? yeah. That so would be the first place you'd use... go. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say, Cal. Yeah, that exactly. would be the first thing you would do is, is rig one below a popping cork, yeah. Yeah, you know, because the great thing about the curly tail jig underneath, underneath the cork is that it doesn't, the action doesn't stop when it, when the, it yes. comes to rest. Yes. That tail keeps working. He's working. So it's sending yeah. out vibration right. that that um, fish are going to get on their lateral lines, and they're going to come in and they're going to check it out. And more often than not, I've had I've used them under popping corks, and more often than not, I've had fish hit it when the the cork was just sitting there on the surface, bobbing up and down. Um, most people tend to use shad tails and shrimp tails underneath a popping cork. Right. But. You know, a four-inch, four-inch um, curly tail grub um, is is incredibly effective, very effective underneath a popping cord. Huh. And again, that's outside the box thinking. Right, but sometimes that's what it requires to catch the fish. If they if they if oh, they're yeah, not going to burn definitely. anything else, you know. And that's the nice thing yeah. I like about a lot about your ideas is they're adaptable. They're 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 oh, yeah, change definitely. change on the fly, you know, and like you, you were talking about when we first started out with the with the fly, with the um, catching the trout on the bottom, um, you know right. that that that's just you got to do it sometimes. And I mean the, the the innovators of that kind of stuff is guys like you and me that write, and also those guides that uh -huh. have to find the fish. You know, <laughs> you learned a lot of the good stuff from the guides, you know, over the years. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and there's some guides out there, and there's some anglers, a lot of them, and all of them, I respect very deeply, who would never use bait. Right. You know, and, um, you know, I mean, and I, I don't begrudge them that, but, you know, I mean, sometimes, heck, you've got to do what the fish tell you that they want. Yep. You, you know, got to adapt another time. I've seen, yeah, you know, and a, a, a bait that is kind of outside the box a live bait that is outside the box are pinfish and pig perch or, yeah. or pigfish. Piggies. Um, yeah, piggy perch. You know, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of people would, you know, they swear by croaker, but, you know, croaker, I mean, if the trout isn't feeding on croaker, he's not going to eat croaker. If, you know, there's certain times of the year where other baits become the prevent, preference of the predator. There are times of the year where pinfish are what they want. Okay. You know, and, 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 um, but still a lot of people don't use them, which is kind of funny. Um, um, Chad Kinney, Captain Chad Kinney, who has a bait shop in, um, in Fort Mansfield. I've talked to him before. As a matter of fact, um, my, um, September column is loosely titled the art of bait, <laughs> which is going to be about using the different types of bait. And Chad Kinney is going to help me with this. Um, he has told me in the past that, you know, there are times where people still buy croaker when the trout are hitting croaker less and pinfish more. You know, and there are times of the year where the little pig grunt, the little pig fish, um, 
are more effective bait than anything else. You know, there are times of year where the trout and the redfish will tell you what they want. Right. You know, and you have to pay attention. You know, you have to pay attention and do what they want. You know, to me, it makes no sense why someone would go out and keep throwing a super spook when the trout are on the bottom hitting silver spoons. Right. Yep. I follow you. you. And there are some, and there are some anglers who are that headstrong. That's why we have you know, sayings in, in fly fishing like match the hatch, you know, uh, throw exactly. what throw what they're eating on, you know, throw what they're naturally feeding on. And I mean, there's some anglers that are just so headstrong as far as the the pride that they had. They don't want to change that up. But I mean, and, and, and I can't use Chester's word of ch- trout snobs here, but, um, you know, it's yeah. just one of those things that, that I think is kind of funny. But it's just one of those things where it's just like, you know... I, you've got to you've got to adapt and overcome. I mean, that's what it all boils down yeah. to. I think. Yeah, you know, and ironically, I mentioned the allure just now, the silver spoon. Yes. That has fallen so far out of practice using a silver spoon that it has become out of the box thinking <laughs> to use one. <laughs> and and you that as far as for trout or for redfish or for what? For trout, for speckled trout. Okay. Because there was a time where that was the only lure available, was the silver spoon. Right. You know? And millions, literally millions of pounds of trout were caught with the silver spoon. But as plastic started, as, as the advent of plastics came around, they, the, the silver spoon fell more and more out of practice. You know? And I can tell you, there are times, you know, I mean... Someone put a gun to my head and said, what are you going to take weight fishing? <laughs> oh, I'm going to take a silver spoon. <laughs> you know, you can fish a silver spoon up on top. You can fish it on the bottom. Right. You can fish it in the middle depths. You can burn it. You can slow roll it. Yep. It's a very versatile bait, but, n- but very few anglers use it anymore. So it's become out of the box. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, you say that, but I was yeah. fishing out in uh, um, Louisiana, southern southern Louisiana, uh, a couple, of, you know, I guess it was 2017, so it's been a couple of years ago now, maybe about a year and a half yeah. ago, and I was fishing with a guide, and, and his whole deal with, with fishing the marsh was to throw a yeah. spoon, a gold spoon in his case. There you go. And so he said, you know, this is why we catch bass and we catch redfish both on gold spoons. And it's kind of our little ace in the hole when the fish aren't really biting. Because that day they were just kind of locked jar. They, they weren't talking. Um, yeah. They weren't they weren't coming in the boat. And so, I, you know, I basically was just like, well, that's that's kind of a G. I, I would have never thought that as a regular angler. I was thinking, well, what about this Z-Man over here or this DOA over here or the soft plastic or, exactly. you know, the hottest, sexiest thing. And it's just like sometimes that's not what they want, you know. you got to feed them what they want. So Exactly. You know what my favorite trout and redfish killer in the surf is? What's that? A three-quarter ounce Castmaster silk chrome with a blue stripe on it slab and that is my lure of choice for the surf you're talking about a cast master slab right yes the slab yeah slab you want to know why okay i'm listening in the summers when i when i wade the surf the southeast wind can be pretty stiff okay and and when you're surf fishing you are facing the southeast wind but whether you're using bait casting tackle or spinning tackle, you can punch that three quarter ounce slab into the wind and get a fifty yard cast. And it has a wobble and a flash that has always been very effective. Because of that weight, you're talking three quarter ounce, is that what you said, right? Yeah. It's not just the three three quarter ounce, it's the shape. Oh the shape of it too, yeah. I was you know, gonna those, say that next too. Yeah, yeah they're very absolutely. Yeah, they're they're very dense and they're very aerodynamic, and they will go out there. You know, a tip. Uh, you know, I'll use Johnson spoons out there, but if the wind is up, they'll catch the spoon up in the air, and I'm picking out a bird's nest. Right. You know? <laughs> but you can you can knuckleball. Yeah. You can knuckleball those 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 cast masters and get it out there, and they're very effective. They have an action and a flash that the fish don't ignore. You know, and that's that 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 chrome. That chrome flash imitates just about every forage fish in the surf. Yes, you know you've got pilchards out there. You've got small, you've got small skipjack. You've got menhaden. Sometimes yep. you've got ballyhoo out there. 
you know, the, it, the flash imitates just about everything out there that the that the predators eat. But if you would tell now, tell that to you, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, go. Sometimes now, sometimes a Spanish mackerel come calling, and right. you, you end up having to retie a lot if you don't have a wire leader. But they're still very effective for everything. Well, my whole what I was just getting ready yeah. to say was the fact that you know. You say that to a, a, a diehard saltwater fisherman, he may laugh at you, but it works. And if it works, what can you argue with exactly. with what was success? You know, why mess with success? Like the old saying goes. You know, I mean, if it's something that's going exactly. to that's going to pull the fish in, then you've kind of won your argument. You know, because you've proven that it works. Oh, yeah. you know? I mean, so yeah. I just I just see a lot of saltwater fishermen, you know, and freshwater fishermen too, saying, well, you know, if you're not using these baits, like I, for instance, there's a guy on on a, uh, on tv that hunts hogs and i won't name any 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 names here but you know he he was talking about his hoyt you know fancy model of his hoyt bow and if you're not shooting it i feel sorry for you and i'm just like you're missing the point man use what you have all right but also yeah. think outside the box like we're talking about on this podcast because i mean you may not know it all you know but a lot of guys walk around and act like they do exactly and all that they use is all that works yeah. and the only thing that works and i don't like that you know no, you know you're exactly right on that. Um, There's you know, my and, rant. <laughs> and, and to be an effect, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. You know, um, and if you want to be an effective angler, you have to be willing to do that. Yes. You know, I mean, I have my comfort zone. I really do. Um, but I sometimes come out of it. You know, I mean, another another lure that I don't see anybody in saltwater down here using, and I learned about it in Florida from a couple of other anglers. I use four inch tubes. Okay. Like the strike like the Strike King coffee tube. I like the larger tubes because they have better action. Which is more I of like a freshwater bait, correct? There. Am I saying that right? It's more of a freshwater oh, bait. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's what a I bass figured. Bait. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a big time bass bait. Yeah. I like throwing tubes, especially in the white and in the dark brown. Okay. Um Great actions, and it, and you know, um, and um, when you're working on fishing along the intercoastal waterway up here yep. or down here, you know, I mean, you you again, you have contact with the bottom, and they have a great, great spiraling action as they as they go down, you know, um, and I've even learned um, how to rig them, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can get this uh, get this film for the website. I'm trying to talk my wife into being my cinematographer for this. <laughs> Good um, luck. It's called, yeah, it's called the stupid tube. Okay. It's, it's a very popular, um, technique in the Midwest. Um, and it's won quite a few tournaments up there and I've started experimenting it with it down here. It's, it's in, and I have, I, it's difficult to describe, but it's very easy to show, and it's actually very easy to learn how to use it. Huh. Um, but the stupid tube um, has a very interesting action as it as it sinks, and it's it's very attractive to to redfish especially um, because redfish will see it coming down. It looks like I guess like a dying the dying bait, and they just charge it. And huh. I've caught some nice redfish with it. Um, it's again an out of the box strategy for salt water, but it works. I love you it. Know. I think that's great. And the yeah. other thing I was going to mention to you real quick is the fact of the football head jig. Isn't it yeah. a good idea yeah. to use? And I'm not plugging Z Man here by any means, but the the main thing I yeah. bring up here is um, is the their Elastec material that they have that they make their, their oh, yeah. like the trout trick out of. Okay, it floats. Okay, yeah. And so I would think a combination of a football jig, football head jig with a uh, jig head with a, with a floating, um, you know, so so it would always pull, it would even add aid in adding It'll the stand buoyancy, straight up. stand straight up on the football head. Yeah, exactly. That I, I kind of just thought that would be a unique combination, you know, for outside the box fishing. Yeah, you so. know, and that makes me think, I kind of wish these lures, these baits were still in production because I'd love to use them in saltwater. I don't know if you remember them from when you were a little kid. 
Krim used to come out yes. with a tube worm. Yes, 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 I do. You know? Krim's the one that invented the plastic worm, as, as they say. It. They tell me that at iCast yeah. every year, at least. And I, I, I imagine that's true. But I was kind of like, you know, that's kind of cool. I mean, they kind of innovated plastics for fishing. Exactly. You know, and I, I guess the, the, their tube worm fell out of favor. I used to love using them when I was, when I was young. When tube I was a kid, worms, yeah. I'd go and fish. Yeah, I'd fish with my grandfather's um, stock tanks, and that was all I used were tube worms, and and um, <laughs> caught all the bass that I could with those dadgum things. You know, they were really cool. You know, now imagine using one of those things in salt water. You know, um, wow, Cal, that's way I outside really, the box. I don't know. I don't know if that could work. Yeah, it know? is way out of the box. But you know, how cool would it be to throw those around the jetties to see what would kill it? Right. You know. It, you know, I mean, um, I, I, I think, I think it was Chester who once wrote that he had used one of the little creme double hook worm rigs with the propellers on it from, yeah. at, um, on the jetties once and lost the biggest trout of his life that had <laughs> grabbed it. You know, I think, I, I'm not sure if it was Chester. We'll have to ask him about but that. We'll have to ask. We got to get but, all three together on the podcast again, like we did, um, the, get on, oh, get a I'd show love together. To do that. Just a phone show, you know, because yeah, we, we've done the, a get couple get of live ones. Back together. Get the, put the band back together, exactly. But no, you're right. And I mean, I, yeah. I still remember those growing up is the double hook, um, the double, the double hook with the propeller on the front, creme lure. I mean, that that's like a co- iconic classic you know, uh, lure there and to use it in salt water, it's just like, it's foreign, you know, to a lot of people. Yeah. But, you know, think about this. I don't think any respectable adult bass fishermen would ever buy those. It was always 12, 13 year old kids like yeah. us, you know, <laughs> we, we saw those things. They were like a buck 29 yep. and we'd buy one. They caught us. Yeah, exactly. We'd buy one. It had this. It had the classic snail loop on it that you tied your line to, yeah. and you'd go and you'd fish in the irrigation canals and stock tanks and everything. And by God, it would catch it would catch bass. You know, <laughs> we'd buy one. You know, I just you go to the store to buy one bait. You know, to fish for the rest of the summer. You know, <laughs> I mean, exactly. Those you know, some great and, and days you back then. Protected that thing with yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we gotta gotta glue it back together. Get the super glue out. <laughs> Even you know. Had, yeah. had the fancy st- super glue like we have today. But, yeah, you're right. We just kind of, you know, it's kind of like the old, I was saying this to my son earlier today. You know, what we did back in the day was the old World War II saying, the Great Depression saying is, is um, let me see if I can remember this all the way. Um, you can uh, uh, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. And, you know, exactly. that's what we that did for exact, fishing back in the day. I heard that one, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, that's an old one a lot yeah. of people haven't heard. But I thought that's kind of cool for this generation of fishermen. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and what did – and whether we were fishing fresh or salt water, what did – what was our rod and reel? A Zebco 33. You got it. Yeah. You know, everyone Fantastic. used the Zebco 33, and it worked. By God, it worked. You know, It wasn't fancy, we, but it got the that, job done. Yeah. Yeah, and as we got older, we thought we had hit the big time when we got the Zebco Cardinal spinning reel. <laughs> right? Am I right? You're right, man. You know? Golly, I mean, you, you, you look at the tackle we own these days, and I know you're just like I am, and you've got a bunch of very nice, nice high-dollar rods and reels. But think about it. When we were kids, it was a Zebco 33, and we caught everything, catfish, bass, speckled trout, you know, if we were stupid enough to try it, we caught a redfish on it. You know, I mean, those rods and reels work great. That's the thing I love it's about you, Cal. Is just is just that you believe in getting back to basics and just the the the, the what attracts us to fishing the therapeutic part of fishing. You know, the the uh, the soul bearing part of fishing, if you will. Um, I always yeah, get exactly. introspective on these shows with you, but I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where I've just kind of like, you know, like we talked about when Chester and you and I got together at the, uh, at the Houston fishing show about our first fishing memory and our most embarrassing fishing moments and all that other stuff. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that dreams are made of right there. You know, I mean, that's the stuff exactly. that really, really counts in the end, not the biggest or the baddest. And I always talk about that to my listeners on this podcast that guys, it's not all about, you know, getting that trophy stroker, you know, this, this giant, you know, whatever. It, it's about the memories that you make with your family and your friends. You're, you're, you're exactly right. You know, and not only that, you know, um, 
life, we have a saying in Spanish is, hay más tiempo que vida. There's more time than life. Okay. Why would you want to waste any of your time doing something that isn't fun? Right. <laughs> and not have having fun while you're doing it. Right, right, right. You know, right. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not speaking for the people who have to do it to survive or the people who do it for a living. I'm talking about the rank-and-file angler like you and me. Yep. You know, really, when you think about it, we can do something else to for a paycheck. And I actually do. I'm a school teacher. Writing is my application. Right. But, you know, why would we do something if we didn't enjoy it? Sure. You know? I agree with you. Why yeah. roll out of bed? Yeah, roll out of bed, get dressed, get in the vehicle at dark 30 to drive to the water and to work for four, five, six, 12 hours, waving a stick, waiting for a jerk on one end to, to ha make a jerk on the other end happy. <laughs> Why would we do all that if it, if it wasn't fun? Yeah, you're right. It's, you it's know, all about. Yeah. Why, why waste the time? You know, yeah. I mean, there, there's a show on um, on the outdoor channels, the Mud Bums, um, and those guys act like, I mean, you can tell they're having a blast with what they're what they're doing. You know, Bill Dance, all his shows, you can tell he's having fun. Jimmy Houston, all of the people on TV, you can tell they're having fun. Why else do it? Right. They all seem smart enough and ambitious enough that they could make a living any other way and be successful. Sure. You know, you know, you've got to have the you you have to enjoy what you do. Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, you take up something more banal. You take up something more banal like golf. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You which know, is, I mean, which is know, interesting to and, some. That's and cool, even that. Right? Yeah, and everyone, everyone. Let me tell you, say this. My dad golfs. He's going to try and get me to golf this summer. Don't write to me telling me that I, I misunderstand golf. Please don't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's funny. You know, um, yeah, but, you know, I mean, fishing, you know, and, and there's a bit of a thrill that I get when I do an out-of-the-box strategy and it works. Yep. You know, and I walk out going, yeah, it worked. Woo! <laughs> you know? But there's plenty I mean, that you tried, I know, because you're like me. I am actually me. smart. Yeah, there's plenty you've tried that haven't worked, too. I mean, we've all been there. That's how you get the outside-of-the-box strategies anyway. But I just I find it funny that you as an outdoor writer and a, and a saltwater editor, you know, are like the – because I normally would expect somebody that guides full-time to come out with the outside-the-box stuff. But to have you on the podcast was just – what a great idea. I mean, that's awesome. I just, I didn't even yeah. think about this when we sat down and record this. I was just like, "What's what's Cal and I going to talk about tonight?" And I'm just like, "Well, that's perfect. Outside the box strategies for saltwater fishing." So yeah, <laughs> you know, well, let's let's face it. Some the orthodoxy doesn't always work. Right, right. Which is the whole point of this show is just to give people some other ideas for trout or redfish exactly. or flounder or whatever. Um, you know, the, the the holy trinity there they're in of uh, of you know inshore saltwater. But I mean, it's, it's, I've just, the more I fish and I've, I've fished for most of my life, I mean, just like you have Cal, it's just one of those things where it's not that big of a deal if it doesn't work or if it works, it's all about the journey. It's all about the experience. It's not all about just, exactly. just, just, you know, if it's going to hook up with something, but it's all about trying new things and, exactly. and finding the things that work, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. so that's just, <laughs> that's yeah, just and, and let me put this message. Let me put this message out to your listeners. Sure. You probably watched some show where they're fishing in some exotic place and they're using some strategy and you're sitting there going, hey, that might work over here. <laughs> Go ahead and try it. Who's going to say you can't do it? Yeah, absolutely. You know? And the worst thing that happens is you don't catch any fish. Right. Yeah, you know? I get that. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try anything. I just what you I know, love about you, um, Cal, is that you're bringing over like freshwater baits and strategies and lures and stuff over to saltwater, and and you're talking about cases where it's really paid off, you know. And I mean, it sounds crazy, but yeah. I mean that that's kind of the basis of this show. What we're talking about is 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 bass fishing for saltwater, you know. I mean, in a way, for some of the stuff at least. 
So. Yeah, well, exactly. You're exactly right. You know, um, I know that you know I I know that a lot of fishermen up in Sabine and in the marshlands use spinner baits. Oh yeah. You know. You know, and and the irony is that when I was 12 years old, I was spending the week at the old outdoor resorts in in Port Isabel at a friend's um, campground, and there were some flats nearby, and I had brought along an old H&H spinner, a yellow H&H spinner. That's another kid's bait. I know er er tons of kids who have bought that thing to go fishing for bass. (laughs) Well, I had brought it along. So I went out to this flat near the campground, one early morning and I was waiting and I was throwing that thing and I caught 13 trout. Now this was before the 10 trout limit and before the five trout limit. I caught 13 (laughs) keeper trout. Yep. I was happy as a clam. I was strutting like a peacock and I walked over to the fish cleaning station there um, at outdoor resorts and some old coot was there and he asked me, what did you catch all those fish on? And I showed him, I showed him the, the spinner tied to the end of my rod and he called me a liar oh my goodness because trout don't hit that bass bait obviously not yeah you must and, you must be mistaken sir <laughs> yeah well let me tell you what that old man telling me off like that i put that yellow spin that yellow h and h spinner bait back in my tackle box and i never use it again oh man you know, you know, and I knew it worked because I'd caught the trout. Right. But you he told know. me that it didn't, it, it yeah. wasn't supposed to work. So I stopped using it, oh. you know, and that was terrible. Yeah. You know, um, you know, but, uh, you know, that was the first time I did outside the box. It was really quite by accident. You know, I mean, I just thought, well, if the bass liked it, why not a trout? You're just <laughs> chunking <laughs> you know? and winding away, and there you go. And to think about it, one of my first spinners was a, was a yellow one, actually, a yellow with a yellow skirt and everything. It was, uh, I don't know what brand yeah. it was, but I still have it, and I've got a worm trailer with a curly tail on it, too. And it caught a lot of fish back when yeah. I was a young man, and uh, I still have that same lure. So it's funny you mentioned that, because we all have things that are nostalgic for us, and that was one for me, and it's still in my old tackle box in my garage. Yeah. You know, I, I know some pe- people, I'm sure, out there who have looked at a, a white Meps Aglia or um, another inline spinner like that, you know, and one of the little two-inch ones, and say, I wonder if that would work under the lights. Well, try them. Why yeah. not? You know, yeah, I mean, exactly. they have flash. You know, they have flash to the right size. You know, it's not like the trout's going to go, oh, that's a freshwater bait. I'm not hitting it. <laughs> it looks too you know, fresh water for me you know so i'm gonna yeah I'm that's gonna, a little suspicious i'm a trout and i'm gonna be a snob about that lure yeah no fish don't yeah. think like that man they think food and no, they think they about don't. making more little bitty fish you know and that's that's the two main yeah. things i think about so yeah you know and the great thing about a little itty bitty inline spinner now i'm probably gonna just have to try it some night <laughs> um a little itty bitty inline spinner like that the, 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 the blade gives off a vibration, you know, yes. and these fish are going to feel it. Yes. You know, it's going to, it's going to stimulate their lateral line and they're going to come to investigate and they're going to see the flash. They're going to see the shape and I, I'm sure they'll pop it. You know, I mean, if nothing else, just out of sheer curiosity, you know, um, you know, Ber- Berkeley Gulp has their mud minnow, um, t- uh, lure. I've seen that. That yep. thing looks just, yeah, it looks, to me, it looks more like a goby. But I'll tell you <laughs> what, they work like gangbusters. Huh. You know? That's another. You know, I mean. Huh. Mud yeah. minnow, huh? The okay, sassy cool. shad. The ori- yeah. Yeah. The original Mr. Twister sassy shad. How many of our older listeners out there and older readers have used the sassy shad in salt water and been very successful. That's a good question. You know, you know, outside the box is basically just old school fishing. Well, and the thing is, I've got one of the guys since I do the hotspot reports for most of the freshwater lakes in our magazine, and he he swears by 
uh, I think it's a striper sniper or some kind of some kind of uh, it's like a long eel looking trailer that he puts uh, on on the back of his uh, uh, on the back of his uh, his his rig, and he basically says it's because stripers yeah. are originally a saltwater fish and they they are attracted to you know an eel or whatever the case may be this lure mimics, and that's why they have that ingrained in their brain. And so why wouldn't it work well for freshwater and saltwater? You know because stripers exactly. originally a saltwater water fish uh for, you know if you go way back in time so i mean i um i, I just i just think that kind of stuff it, it makes sense when you look at it from those 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 glasses you know yeah perspective yeah perspective you know, that's right um so but really anglers used to be the most adaptable people out there because they had to to be adaptable in order to succeed um, now that sport fishing is more the norm rather than the anomaly, um, you know, I, I, I really am afraid that some of that adaptability has been lost. You know, um, and that's a pity because, you know, I really believe that, that the thinking outside the box, the adaptability of it is something that enhances the experience. You know, and you get a sense of satisfaction like I've, to- I've mentioned before. Right. Sure. You know? Yeah, that you tried something that worked out that no, not a lot of other people may be using or think about using. You know, and I mean, there is some kind of sense of accomplishment when you pull something like that off. I could just, I, I've, I've done it in freshwater and saltwater both, but I mean, I know how that feels, and that's one heck of a good feeling. You know, it's why we hunt and fish. One of the yeah. things, you know, that, that 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 kind of, you know, hey, I tried something that worked. It's kind of like me urban bow hunting. You know, nobody believed I could shoot a, a 120 class deer in a lady's backyard, but I did it in 2014, and he's hanging on the wall right behind where I'm recording this podcast. Um, you know, just yeah. because nobody else has done it or thought to do it, doesn't mean that you can't go through and and be successful at it. So, I think that's a great yeah, point. Yeah, you're to exactly make. right. You know, and and again, it's an enhancement of the overall experience. Right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. You know, um, a, a, a few years back, almost a decade ago, I wrote a piece about the late Albert Rutledge and a group of his friends who had fished the Laguna Madre since the 30s. Oh goodness, way back. Think about that. Yeah. That's that's 70 years. <laughs> the man was 92 years old when I talked to him. And he showed me pictures, and he talked about it. And you know what was one of the baits they used that was they were with which they were sometimes the most successful. Was that carp? <laughs> carp. They would catch carp in the irrigation canals around here, take it out there, chop it up, use it as cut bait, and catch the hell out of the redfish. <laughs> Now I've uh, I've had Marcus Heflin on this podcast. I'm going to have him back on again next, but uh, probably for one of our next saltwater shows. But he's talking about surf fishing. He's kind of a surf fishing Santa, and he uh, he's he's talking about using cut bait for redfish in the surf. But we've touched on carp before. But I mean, what a you know think about the carp. You know, it's not the first thing you think about when you think of cut bait for saltwater. No, but um, I, it makes sense that it would work because carp is a very oily, oily fish. fish. I was just going to say the same thing. You yeah. know, so it's yep, yeah, it's going to throw a scent out there, and I doubt any redfish is going. Oh no, that's carp! I can't eat that. You know, <laughs> a redfish will eat whatever you put in its face. Yeah, it's going to eat what it's hungry <laughs> for. It, it eats because, like I said, you know, the fish live to reproduce and to eat food. You know, I mean, eat eat bait. So yeah, you know, it's not like it's not like they think. You know, I once got a I once got a, a reader a very upset with me because he had sent me a letter, you know, complaining about croaker then that croaker need to be banned because the reason the trout hit it is because croaker eat trout eggs and trout are hitting it out of yes. revenge. I've heard and that. I've had a guy on the podcast wrote, actually make that point uh, on this show before. So yes. Yeah. You know, and I ha- I actually wrote back and explained at length about the reptilian brain, which is what fish have, yes, and that they are unable to formulate because they lack a frontal lobe. They're unable to formulate emotions, <laughs> so and they're unable to think cognitively. You cannot tell me that a trout sees a croaker and says, "Oh, it's a croaker! I'm going to kill it." 
No, they look at a croaker and say, food! Exactly. <laughs> you know? They don't think of it eating their young, eating their offspring eggs. You know, they think of it as, hey, I'm hungry. And I've actually had, I had a guide on here that talked about the reason why trout hit croaker is because of that reason. Is because they they have yeah. um, they have that that uh, that that instinct that they're going to eat their eggs and so that but I never really bought that whole idea so I like that you brought up the reptilian yeah. brain that's smart especially when you think about what do big trout sometimes eat when they see it right a little trout yeah you know and it could be their offspring they don't care it's food it's protein to them right you, you know I mean um, you know so. So I, it doesn't surprise me that 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 Albert Rutledge and his his cronies used carp, and that the redfish ate it. You know, like I said, they don't think about it. It's food in front of them; they're going to eat it. Yeah, you sure. know. Um, but using carp in salt water, how, now that's outside the box. Way that outside, really the, box. outside yes. the box. Yes. Yeah. You know. I know. Um, you know, and. You know, the first person who ever used chopped up skipjack to catch trout and redfish. That, you know, that was an outside the box moment. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of, a lot of our, our, our successful trips are from outside the box. You know, that's, that's just how it is. Um, you know, changing the species you're chasing yes. is an outside the box strategy. You know, there, there was a time, one time I remember a friend of mine and I went out and we were trying to, um, catch trout and there wasn't a single fish biting as we were coming back to the um to the boat ramp i don't know why we just kind of out, out of just out of speculation we dropped anchor underneath the queen isabella causeway and started throwing live shrimp up against the pilings thinking well maybe we'll catch a, a mangrove snapper or two right and what we ended up doing was we caught a double limit of some of the biggest sheep's head you've ever seen. Oh, wow. You know, you know, and um, that was a change up in strategy. That was an outside the box moment, and it saved the day. It saved the trip. And we went over, and we were there at the at the fish cleaning station filleting out these sheep's head, and all these boats were coming back in with empty, ta- empty coolers because they had beat the water to a foam trying to catch trout and redfish, and the trout and redfish just weren't cooperating. Right, but the sheep's head were, right. You know. Oh, yeah, the sheep said were, you know, I mean, and there are times where I have changed up and gone after mangrove snapper. Uh, uh, one of my best memories of that was um, my wife and I had a couple of really dear friends, John and Gina Breitmeyer, and we had decided one night we were going to go down to Port Isabel. We were going to jump on one of the party boats, go around, chase sand trout, catch a bunch of sand trout. Well, we went down there, and we got there and the boat wasn't going out because it had a blown engine. Well, we had driven all the way down, so by God, we were going to fish. So um, we just started tossing bait around the, the, the pilings of, of the dock, and in about two, two hours, we caught, among the four of us, um, I think 60 mangrove snappers. Golly, that's From amazing. One, between one and three pounds. Right yeah. there off of the shore, you know, or right there off of the 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 dock there. Right there off of the, the dock. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just bopping around, dropping bait around the pilings. We caught the daylights out of these mangrove snapper. And they were <gasps> one to great. two pounds. I mean, sixty of them, and that really stunk because I was the only one who knew how to clean fish. <laughs> <laughs> you got that dirty job. So I'm sorry, up, Cal. <laughs> yeah, I ended up filleting sixty mangrove snapper. You know. And I'm sitting there thinking at that point, you know, maybe I should start rethinking about keeping every dad going. <laughs> yeah, that right. mangrove I catch. <laughs> Throw some back. You know? Yeah. That's where you learn you learn the idea of selective harvest. Right, 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 right. Uh, how many more fish do I have to clean tonight? But, you know, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that was mainly out of necessity because we didn't want to have to turn around and drive all the way back. Um, but, you know, it was an out-of-the-box moment, and it saved the trip. And we had a blast because, you know, mangrove snapper fight like bulldogs. Yep. You know? I don't mean Uga, who got chased off by Bevo at the Sugar Bowl, but real bulldogs. Right, right, right. right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. You know, but um, all you University of Georgia fans, don't write me. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) If uh, any of you are listening. Yeah, that's funny. No, but, you know, those anglers 
who haven't done it and who double who who outthink themselves, don't do it. If you have an out of the box thought, try it. Right. The worst that can happen is it doesn't work. Then you're in the same place you were before you tried it. You know? And so I, you never yeah. know when it will when it'll save the trip. Well, and my whole you thing, know? I think the whole thing we've talked about this whole show is be flexible and be adaptable. Because plans may change. Exactly. I mean, the fish may not be biting on this, but they're biting on this, or this species of fish isn't biting, but the, you know the the flounder are biting, or the redfish aren't, but the trout are, or whatever. I mean, just just having that because I, I I've run into so many, and I talk about this a lot when I talk about uh, outfitters and guides. Cal is just because I, I I you know book hunts for a for a hunting ranch. You know, is one of my many roles in the industry, and uh, you know the one thing I just say is just show up with a good attitude, okay, and have a tip for your guide. Yeah. All right, and just 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 have a really good attitude about how this is going to go, and you're going to give it your best. And if this doesn't work out, you're going to try this, and, and you know you depend on the guide. And it's just all about. I mean, attitude is really everything about all of this. And just you know, just just having that faith that you know, no matter what's going to work out, you're going to have fun. You know, that's why we do all this stuff in the first place. You know, is for recreation. Yeah, and that's and that's the most important thing. I think I've mentioned this on the show. I think I mentioned it when we did the trio podcast with yeah. Chester. Yeah. You know, one of one of my most memorable trips with my wife and son, we um I had mistimed the trip and we got there, we got to the island at drop dead low tide. Yep. So, what we ended up doing was we ended up dropping anchor over by the causeway and um we cast out and within Two minutes, my son had caught about a three and a half pound hardhead. Wow! And then we started catching more hardheads. And I said, "All right, let's go." This is just hardheads. My son didn't want me to move. He was catching hardheads and he was having a blast. <laughs> it's a fish, Dad. <laughs> you know? I love so it. We stayed there for three hours and we caught hardhead after hardhead after hardhead. And he was having fun with these big hardheads. You know, and finally I said, we ran out of bait. I said, all right, let's go. And so we, we we got to the ramp, hooked up the boat, and we drove home. And as I put my son to bed that night, he throws his arms around me, gives me a big kiss on the cheek, and says, thanks for letting me catch all those big catfish, Dad. Oh, man. You know, that's a hell of a memory. It's still one of my favorite memories. Sure. You know, you know and the hard head saved the night. Yep. You know. I would have probably been going all over the place trying to find something else to catch. And I doubt my son would have had the fun he had just catching hardhead catfish. Sure. You know. No, that's... Um, you, yeah. know, you know, think outside the box, guys. You know, adapt to your situation. That's the important part of the... Of the, that's the important message of this this podcast. Tonight. No, that's great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful advice, and I just really think as we close the show out, I, I really think that uh, just thank you for sharing some of your ideas and some of your concepts and some of the uh, the things that you uh, that you that you've done over the years. Because you know, a lot, a lot of times we don't learn from if we don't learn from our own experiences, we learn from listening to somebody else's experiences of what worked and what didn't. And uh, even the funny stories like yeah. we talked about in the show too, Cal. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where my whole purpose of doing this podcast is just to educate people and just helping them to go out and have their version of the best of the outdoors for themselves. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't, I, when I started this, and it's four years ago this month I started this podcast, um, you know, it's just one of those things where I, I was just like, I just, if I could just help people, you know, do what they do better and enjoy God's creation and, and you know, everything like that. But the reason I want to have shows like this is just to bring in the whole concept of you don't have to do it all the same way all the time, man. I mean, if it's not working, do something different. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Dustin, thank you for saying that. And I'll say this. It has been an absolute privilege to share my ideas with the readers of Texas Fish and Game. Um, and I had a little bit of a, a moment a couple of weeks ago because I I had called Bud Rowland to ask him to help me um, because I wanted to eventually write a feature about him and his um, state record speckled trout. Right. Um, and he told me, Bud Rowland, Bud Rowland, the man who caught the state record spectacle trout says, you know, I've always been reading your column and 
what you do is just fantastic, and thank you for that. Wow. My jaw just dropped. I mean, this is Bud Roland complimenting right. me. Right. <laughs> you know, I That's mean, amazing. You know, it was, yeah, it was. It, it meant a great deal, and it means a great deal to realize that what I, the privilege I get to do is enjoyed by other people. Right. You know, it's a hell of a contribution. It's very gratifying to me. Um, it's been a heck of a ride. I'll say that. That's and I look great. forward to continuing this until until Chester says, get out of here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Chester tells me to get out. I got to go, too. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, it's just great. You never know who's watching. You never know who's listening. I mean, I say that about the guys that are trained to do media stuff for a living. You know, I always say you've yeah. just got to be careful, but you also have to put your best foot forward every day. Because you never yeah, know who, exactly. who you're going to impact, who's going to have, you know, who's going to have uh, influence over, over your future and all that other stuff. So, yeah, that's a good yeah, point. You know, it's a real good story. And we are we are fortunate. We are blessed with what we do. You know, right, we really sure. are. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Cal, so, how – yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the one thing I remind – I want to remind everyone out there – that old Spanish saying, hay más tiempo que vida. There's more time than life. So make the time in your life matter the most. That's you good. Know? That's solid. Uh, besides Texas Fishing Games, Monthly Magazine, and Print and Digital, how can people connect with you on Facebook and elsewhere? Well, I, I'm on Facebook. Calixto yep. Gonzalez, C-A-L-I-X-T-O, Gonzalez with an S at the end. I'm out there on Facebook. Just friend request me, and, uh, and you know, I mean, I'm not all that suspicious. I've got friends from all <laughs> over, you know, so I'll probably confirm you as a friend. You know, um, you can reach me that way. Um, my email address is in the magazine, so if you ever have any questions, you can email me direct. Super. Um, I, I'm also I'm also on Twitter. You know, Calixto Gonzalez on Twitter. So you've got questions, you can ask me there. Um, you know that's how you can that's how you can track me down. Cool, good you know, deal. Um, that's awesome. You know, so if if everyone out there is welcome to reach out whenever you want, you know, that's God cool. bless you. You know, if you have a great question that I can answer, I'll do it the best I can. Well, the thing I like about all the guests that I have on this show is most all of them are very accessible people. You know, they're very they're very open to, with their ideas and their time, and they're they're helping other people, and that's the reason why I have the guests that I have on the show is because I don't want some snob. You know, not to overuse that word, but just come yeah. in here and say, oh, I know everything about hunting and fishing you ever need to know. And, you know, that's all. And, and they just kind of guard all their secrets and, and, and don't open their arms to other people that need advice and need help. And, you know, like I say, that's, that's why I'm very protective over who I have on the show for that reason, because I really want the information to be a benefit to everybody, you know, that listens. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm not the kind of person. If anyone ever comes up, where'd you catch those fish? I'm not the person who's going to say on the water. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know? there's plenty of fishermen out there like that, though. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I don't mind telling you wh where to catch them and even how to catch them. You know, right. I mean, you still have to go out there and catch them. There's, an, <laughs> there's enough to go around for everybody. There really is, and a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and um, I remember a. A play I once was in, the title of it was "You Can't Take It With You." Right, you I, I, I did that play when so I was you younger well, too. Yeah, yeah. So you may as well. I played Grandpa Vanderhoff, and I always remember his line: "You can't take it with you, so you may as well leave it behind with someone." Right. You know. Yep. Great line, fantastic. Line. I forgot all about you know, that and, play until you mentioned that. I that I was I was a star in that play back in uh, high school. I guess it was. Yeah, or middle school maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we did it for one act play. We made it all the way to state with that. And, wow! But that's the one line I've always remembered. You can't take it with you, so you may as well leave it behind with right. someone. Right, right. You know that's solid. And that's and you know when I die, my my knowledge goes. You know that's it's gone. So I may as well leave some of it behind with anyone who wants it. Right. You know, and and if people use it and they find it um, useful. That's gratifying to me. Super. That really is gratifying. Yeah, you're right. I feel you know, 100 as a matter of fact. Way. Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, my July column. Um, I used to have a few every few months. I'd write what I'd call my random rambling, and I had not done it for a few years. And um, 
the July column is random ramblings, but they're very specific random ramblings because it's the perspective and knowledge I have gained over the last three years of my illness. Right. Know? Right. And the things that I've learned and the things that I've, I, and I, I wanted to share that with the readers because maybe there's some people who have been walking down the same path I went. Sure. And maybe they can gain a little fortification from hearing what I, I have to say. Absolutely. So we'll see what happens with that. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, um, you never know, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, that's really cool that you're sharing that kind of stuff. So that's really awesome. Um, well, we've been yeah. on for over an hour, so I guess I better let you go. I really appreciate your time tonight again, Cal. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for calling me, Dustin. Thank you for having me on your show. You have a great pop podcast. Thank you know, you. I mean, like I said, we need to get the band back together someday and have the three of us back on and raise the Rukas. Raise you know? the Rukas. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah we got to do that. Fabulous again. Freebirds of the Outdoor Industry. Freebirds. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So. Dustin Bam Bam Warnicky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Cal. I appreciate you. Yeah, you take care, brother. God bless you, and God bless you, everyone who's listening to this, guys. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cal Gonzalez. Yes, I realize this podcast is a little bit longer. If you're still listening, thank you so much for doing so. Um, Cal and I just get off on tangents and just start talking, and uh, I just turn on the microphone and just kind of run with it uh, whenever I get him on the podcast. So I'm really, really, really enjoying having him as part of our show and a uh, continual kind of fixture in our show going forward with me, him and Chester, or Chester, Cal and I, um, you know, doing the iCast show hopefully again this year up, uh, coming up in the future and, uh, did not go to NRA this year, guys. Um, I know a lot of you guys look forward to my NRA coverage as far as that being a guns hunting marksman shooting, um, you know, uh, content that you get from me, uh, that you got from me last year. The reason is the tickets were a little bit more expensive to get up to Indianapolis where they held it this year. And, uh, it was just a really, you know, crazy, it was my anniversary week and there were a lot of compounding factors that, uh, that kind of de determined me not going this year, but still great things to come. Um, got great new guests lined up to come on the show and some you've heard of, from, heard from before and some you haven't. Um, I just, I love this stuff guys. So if you've not done so already, do this every episode um please 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 subscribe to our newsletters if you've not done so already if you found this podcast through the newsletter good for you that's what it's for um share this with your friends give us a five star rating on itunes or wherever you found this or if you can give us a, a one star rating i would understand that too and there's certainly areas that i can improve on the show but i love a five star rating from you if you like what you hear uh, on iTunes, Stitcher, um, you know, wherever you're, you're listening, wherever you can rate this podcast, that would mean the world to me. It'll help more people find it. Um, and then also subscribe to our newsletters, Tactical and Practical Tuesday. You have Wildlife Wednesday, and you have the Thursday Texas State of the Outdoor Nation. They are free. They do not cost you anything. It is fresh new news in your magazine, uh, from the magazine writers, uh, in the content producers, in, uh, in your mailbox three times a week. Plus, we have the Turkey National, we have the Whitetail National, we have Hog Wild, we have a lot of special interest newsletters that are going out. Sharks and Surf is another one that Chester Moore is planning on uh, doing, and, and just really some great opportunities for engagement there. Uh, some ideas that might help you in the outdoors and might help you um, be a, even a better outdoorsman than you already are and have more fun and catch more fish or shoot more ducks or whatever the case may be. Whatever your, your goal is, we're here to help you reach those goals. And I just want to say this too, I say this just about every show too, and I just wanted to, to bring this up because this is something that's on my heart again. It's not just all about getting out there, like I talked about in the show with Cal, I mean, it's not just all about there getting out there, catching the most uh, fish, you know, as far as numbers go, catching the biggest size and that kind of stuff. It's just about the outdoor lifestyle. It's about the experience that we share because you can't take any of the stuff with you. You can have all the boats, you can have all the, the trucks, you can have all the gear, but you can't take any of it with you. What you can take with you are memories. And you can leave those imprints of memories in the hearts of those you love and the hearts of those that love you. And uh, the, the circle of influence that we all have is, is so vitally important going through life, you know, taking care of that circle of influence, you know, experiencing those things with your kids or grandkids, uh, with your friends, with your the folks you fellowship from church with, or, or whatever the case may be. My thought is that experiences are where the lessons are learned in life and where we are meant to take the impressions 
of life from um, as we go through life. Because even if you don't have a big boat or a fancy car or truck, or if you don't have a fancy house that you live in and store all your hunting and fishing gear in and that kind of stuff, you're still loved, okay? You're still, you're still getting out there and doing stuff. Use what you got. You don't have to be super duper fancy, all right? Um, you don't have to just go after one species of fish or one species of, of game to hunt or whatever the case may be and just say that that's your end all, be all, and that's all you ever want to do. Just branch out and just spend those experiences with your loved ones uh, in your life. I mean, that's one thing I wanted to bring home on this show because Cal and I talked about that kind of in detail of some things that we remember when we were growing up, you know, bass lures that we used and, uh, you know, and... And, and crappie lures and all kinds of different catfish bait and all this different kind of stuff that we grew up around sharing that experience with the other ones in your life you know is really what makes life meaningful and i'm really big as you know if you listen to me much at all really big about meaning significance and uh, purpose in life meaning significance and purpose um you know and to find those things is is just a, an important part of life and uh, finding those in the hunting and fishing realm is also an important part of doing what you do because those things inspire other people and those things uh, leave positive impressions on other people in life. Uh, And and the way that we look at conservation, the way that we look at, you know, uh, uh, getting our kids started, you know, youth development and stuff, getting kids started in, in the hunting and fishing sports and that kind of stuff, it all matters. And uh, it's all about making our sport that much better for the future and that much better for our youth and our our newcomers that are maybe across the aisle from us that don't understand hunting and fishing that want to get in it for the recreational value and the uh, the morale and everything else uh, that, uh, that it helps build. So anyway, that's my thoughts for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, reading, and listening, for checking out this show. Again, please tell a friend. Thank you for spreading the good news about the best of the outdoors podcast i'm your hostess with the most is dustin von warnke you can check me out at fishgame.com i've got all of my articles and everything on there you also have um, a personal website that has all, kind of a hub of all of my outdoor activity uh dustinsprojects.com that's all one word dustinsprojects.com um and uh, that's free stuff for you to watch and read i've been doing product reviews i've been doing uh special digital edition videos for our digital magazine uh section you know that that is in addition to the print magazine that you get every month and those are all online at fishgame.com so just some great things coming down the pipe uh really appreciate you guys checking out our show again i'll say it thank you guys so much for watching reading and listening have an awesome day in the outdoors we'll see you next time